quick plug for our next event. Um, coming up very quickly on June 23rd from 10 to 11.30 a.m. Um, it's going to be somewhere in a law classroom. We're <laughs> still nailing that down. Um, we will send out an announcement via HL um, comms when we do get it nailed down, hopefully very soon. Um, our tentative title right now is Hollis Plus Usability Testing and Analytics. Um, we're going to have updates from two um, working groups that report up to the Access and Discovery Standing Committee, which are, this group also reports up to the Access and Discovery Standing Committee. The two groups are the Portal Working Group and Discovery to Delivery Working Group, also known as D2D. You might have heard of it. So, without further ado, I want to introduce our speakers. We have um, Nettie Legassi. Ah, oh, Legassi. <laughs> Associate Director for Programs at NISO. Um, she's going to talk about <coughs> NISO, the standards, what they do, what they're all about. Laura Morse, Director of um, Library Systems at here at LTS. She's also the co chair of the NISO Open Discovery Initiative Standing Committee. So she's going to talk about ODI itself, the guidelines that were just published in April. Um, some there were some materials for libraries sure. published in April, yeah. so which will give us the whole scoop on what yes. ODI is all about. Um, and then Lauren Sire and Noel Ryan, um, they're members of the ITS e Resources Unit, and they're going to talk about licensing and negotiation of Harvard-wide resources. Um, please ask questions during the session. Um, hopefully, there'll be time at the end also for questions, but feel free to interrupt the speakers. And this session is being recorded. Um, so just so you know, we're recording it, and we'll put um, send a link out via HL comms when it's over with the recording of this session. So great, Eddie. Hey. Over. Will. I think yours is up. Here. Do I need to speak into a mic or anything like that? It should be. Ca hopefully, yeah. you're pinching you. It's pinching you. Pinching the the mic. Oh, that's the mic. Okay, good. Um, but there are also mics up above. And he's so no whispering. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to whisper because there are mics in the ceiling. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'm as uh, we said. I'm Nettie Legassi, and I'm the associate director for programs at NISO, which is the National Information Standards Organization. Um, who has heard of NISO? Oh, good. So everyone, so that's that's great. Um, NISO, and just by way of disclosure, NISO is actually based in Baltimore, Maryland. That's where the NISO office is. Um, but we are a really small staff, and I work from my home in Medford. So it's very easy for me to get over here this morning. Didn't have to come very far. Um, let's figure out where my slides are. I think they're down at the bottom. Down at the bottom. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. And so my, I think my role in this presentation is just to provide some background um, about NISO and the kinds of things that we work on in our perspective and, um, and then I, I think Laura is going to describe how um, ODI in particular uh, fits in. Uh, but um, I just to give you the, the background, so NISO it's a standards organization that's in our name. Um, and we create and maintain all kinds of standards, but more and more we are creating what we call recommended practices or best practices. And these are lower level documents than the full-fledged standards, and I have a slide coming up about that, and I just want to make the distinction um, between those two types of documents uh, for purposes that you'll see a little later on. Uh, we also work very hard to foster adoption of existing standards. We try to keep tabs on how people are using the things that we've created as a community and um, how well they're taken up. There are, I will say, a number of things that uh, NISO has published that I'm not sure anyone uses, um, and that's sort of uh, not something we want to keep doing. So uh, a big part of how we create things is trying to figure out how things are actually going to be taken up. Um, we also work to educate community on different technology-related issues through our publications and uh, some of our thought leader groups. And then we also incubate uh, different activities. We try to keep uh, an eye on things that are going on in publishing, in libraries, in information in general, and figure out how libraries and publishers can get into um, that kind of uh, uh, discussions. So what is NISO? Um, as I mentioned, NISO is a really small staff. There's only five of us staff. 
Um, but I think of NISO as really the community, and that includes people or organizations who are members of NISO and um, others who are not members of NISO. It is possible to participate in NISO's work without being a member, uh, which is a nice thing that allows us to be a little bit more um, uh, wide, widespread. And basically, uh, we are more or less equally made up of um, libraries and library organizations, so organizations like ALA or NASAID or um, ACIS, um, the American Society for Information something technology, um, and, uh, and then also publishers and publishing organizations, so Elsevier, Wiley, but also uh, people who provide services to publishers, uh, the technology that underlies a lot of publisher um, actions. Uh, those organizations are also members of NISO, and then library system suppliers, so Ex Libris, ProQuest, uh, EBSCO, uh, intermediaries like Harassowitz, um, those kinds of companies are also uh, members of NISO. Also on this slide, I input little links to ISO and ANSI and other standard development organizations, that's um, SDOs. NISO is accredited by ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, for the standards we publish. And I have a few slides coming up that talks about the perspective of ANSI and the sort of rules that we need to follow um, as part of our ANSI accreditation. But that's a really important part of the work we do um, that makes it all very official and uh, I think a little bit higher level than just a bunch of people getting together to write some documents. Um, ANSI also hooks us into ISO, the International Standards Organization, um, for their group on information and documents. Documentation. So all of the ISO standards, like ISSN, ISBN, DOI, um, that are library and information publisher related, NISO represents the United States vote on those standards. So uh, that is a very important role for us and a nice way for uh, the NISO organization and those who are involved in NISO to keep abreast on what's going on on standards at the national level, but also the international level. And I think more and more things are pretty much international anyway, uh, since the internet is really erased most boundaries or many boundaries. Um, I think the, the biggest, the, the more important things that are happening are international and it's, it's very hard to have something be very specifically national anymore. Um, so what do standards do? Um, standards are essentially kind of the, um, the backbone, or in my slide, of, I'm thinking of it as the electricity. Uh, you have electrical standards, and uh, you can, uh, once you've agreed on what the, what the wattage is and what the, the voltage is, then you can create all kinds of different things on top of that platform that might provide spe more specific applications. Um, and standards are generally there to make sure that things are connecting in the right places, in the right ways, at the right times. And um, they also help people understand how to do something. So I think a lot of people will look at NISO documents even just to understand the background for a particular topic. So that's something that we also, uh, uh, when we're putting together documents, try to keep in mind that people who are coming to these documents may not be expert in, experts in these areas, but they're trying to pull together uh, a common understanding of what these things might mean um, in order to then move on in their own particular way uh, for their own particular application. It's also used to help understand what consumers are getting. So vendors will uh, adhere to a particular standard and then consumers can say, all right, I know what this means and I'm going to uh, understand that I'm getting a particular type of quality for this. And then in general, building trust between customers and suppliers. Uh, so they're really a, an important way to communicate and um, help people who are interacting in a particular field to, uh, to talk to each other and share information at a very basic level. Um, I also said earlier that I want to make a distinction in, uh, between the documents that we at NISO create, which are sometimes standards, and sometimes what we call recommended practices. And these are uh, 
we create other types of documents too, technical reports, white papers, occasionally, but the major outputs from NISO are uh, standards and recommended practices, and more and more we're, we're creating recommended practices. Um, one example of a standard is OpenURL, and that is uh, all of our standards start with Z39. So if you've heard of Z39.50, that's our most uh, famous library standard. Um, but Z39.88 is OpenURL, and that was published in uh, 2000. And it's actually undergoing a revision or a, sorry, a, a renewal process this year. Um, and standards are um, stamped by ANSI. They go through the process of being drafted by a group. And um, then we send them to ANSI, and ANSI stamps them with a Z39 dot whatever number, and uh, we publish it, and then it goes through a process of uh, review of at least every five years, if not more frequently. Um, but recommended practices are a little bit lighter weight. Um, they can be created more quickly because they don't have to go through the ANSI processes, the different forms that we need to fill out at ANSI and waiting periods and so on. Um, and they can also be updated a little bit more frequently than standards do because of the lack of ANSI overhead in this case. Um, we have been creating more recommended practices these days, I think because mainly because the information area is very fast moving. And it's very hard to know um, in advance when things are going to settle down. Uh, so typically you'd want to create a standard after thing after uh, technology has settled down enough so that it's standing still and people can agree on what things mean. Um, whereas recommended practices are a little bit more appropriate when things haven't quite settled down, but people might be forming questions about what does this mean? How do I communicate with you? Um, you can put together a recommended practice a little bit faster because you aren't necessarily uh, tied to having things be so settled. Um, and you can be ready to update or change a recommended practice in a little bit of a, uh, a quicker uh, motion. However, um, the things that ANSI uh, requires of us <coughs> at NISO are still always present in recommended practice formation. So I'll just pull up uh, these three. So we have, um, I guess, uh, standards that we need to adhere to that are given to us from ANSI. And these are sort of the rules that we need to follow in creation of the working groups that create either standards or recommended practices. Recommended practices, we're not tied to ANSI for recommended practices, but it's a lot easier in terms of setup just to have everything running the same way. And I think it's important to keep the same kind of, of trust. So um, when we put together working groups for recommended practices, um, it's my job to uh, ensure that there's balance, that the group does not consist of 80% librarians, um, that we have, if not an equal balance, of publishers, librarians, and others, that it's more or less um, equal, or at least not one group does not constitute the majority on the group. Uh, we also have a process of consensus, so that we open up the document to comment at a pre-publication stage and invite comments from everyone that we can find. And that's maybe one of the harder things that I do now is trying to find all the different audiences that could respond to a DISO draft uh, for some of the things we're doing. I, I want to ensure that it has a very broad reach so that people have an opportunity to uh, comment on it, ask questions, and then the working group needs to review all the comments, respond to them, and uh, if not, necessarily take them into account in a redraft of the document to at least reason, you know, send a reasonable reply about why the, the comment might, might not make it into the document. Um, and if there's negative voting uh, during the, the approval process for a document, these need to be resolved. And in fact, for the Open Discovery Initiative, um, there was a negative vote by one of our uh, voting members during the document approval period that we had to uh, take some time to, to get resolved in the document. But that's a very important part of the process, that people don't feel like documents have been railroaded through or that they've been um, uh, pre-agreed by some small party. Um, it's very important that everyone's input is taken into account. Um, and then that goes along into the open process where um, 
we have to foster the fact that um, everyone should have a say in what goes into our documents. But they are created by a community and not just a small uh, cable of, of a few people. Um, so the working group process. So when we put together a working group for uh, a NISO work, just to um, help you understand how it works, I, I, when I was putting together this slide, I think of it as sort of the how do you make the sausage. Um, and I've become personally interested in charcuterie, but maybe uh, a picture of a sausage is not so uh, appetizing for any presentation. And if you could think of it as knitting, and I, I do like to knit. So um, it, is, it is kind of pulling together different threads into a pattern that is pleasing, but also might be frustrating at times as uh, things might not up. But uh, when we start a project at NISO, we make a call to everyone and we put together a working group that's balanced, as I said. Um, and the, the idea for a project needs to go through our voting member approval. So everyone who's a voting member of NISO needs to say, okay, this is something that's worth our time. Uh, we form the working group. Um, the working group then uh, discusses the, the overall work and decides how it's going to proceed. Uh, what's the time frame? What are the exact deliverables so that everyone's not sort of working off into space, that they've got some idea of what they're striving for, and everyone on the group agrees to that. Um, they gather input. Usually the group will uh, do something like create a survey, decide who, if they need to interview people who are stakeholders in the project, um, try to do maybe literature research or gather data from different sources, bring it back to the group, and then analyze it. Uh, start putting out an output, a document. Maybe the document can be five pages long. Maybe the document is 30 or more pages long. It really depends on what the, what the project is. As I mentioned, uh, the public review takes place where people send in comments and questions, and that's usually 30 to 45 days. Um, the group then needs to respond to the comments and perhaps modify their document. <coughs> um, it's published. We try to make a big fanfare about that, put out a press release, uh, put out as many announcements as we can, and make it available on our website for free, of course. Um, and then we typically have to have some group or set of people start to market and educate uh, the community on that project because just because something something is published doesn't mean that people are going to pay attention to it. So um, we try to create groups that will then um, be closer to the audiences and help people understand how the document could be used, answer any questions that might come up about it, and then also decide if something needs to be revised, maintain and update it when the time comes as things are moving on and the landscape is changing. So. Um, that's the role of standing committees. We don't have standing committees for all of our documents. Um, I tried to get them set up as soon as possible following the publication of a particular document, um, just so we get a we hit the ground running. Some they usually they are usually consisting of some of the people who participated in the original working group and some new people, just to keep the fresh blood. People have other uh, things that they might need to go back to, um, and just to to, to keep things fresh, um, but we always have the same balance of stakeholders, so the same libraries, publishers, vendors, others uh, type of balance, and they are responsible for the kinds of things that you would expect to help people understand how to use uh, documents, and I think that's uh, something that Laura will be discussing in her uh, document. So just I want to mention some of the uh, challenges to creating standards and recommended practices. Um, I've been at NISO for five years, and I have to say that I didn't think I was going to stay at NISO this long, um, but it is actually a really fun job to talk to different people in different projects um, who are coming with different levels of expertise, all kinds of different things. Um, I, I myself am no longer an expert in, in any particular area. I try to just know who is going to be an expert. Um, and part of my job, though, is to to keep the momentum going and to help keep people excited in working at NISO because they are all volunteers. Everyone who does something for NISO has a day job with other responsibilities. Um, so there are some challenges that um, I think uh, sort of need to be considered both by people who are participating in NISO and also people who are reading NISO documents, something that you have to keep in mind that's, that's part of the makeup of this. 
um, that sometimes people are participating for different reasons. Sometimes people do want to participate in a particular project, but sometimes there's a competitive reason for that in terms of the overall landscape. Um, always NISO documents are scoped to fit a particular time period. So this is a very hard thing. That's often a number of the comments that we get is, are, why did you leave this out of the document? This is really important to me. But in order to, for the document to be finished, certain things need to be left out. And hopefully we'll be able to address them in a future version of the document. But that's always a hard thing, is just cutting, cutting uh, when things need to be uh, left out of our materials. Um, we always go through this discussion in recommended practices. All of our recommended practices on so many different areas, all of the working groups have at least one discussion about, are we recommending something that is the ideal state that everyone should strive for? That's a recommendation. Or are we admitting that there are certain things that certain parties will never be able to attain for different costs or different resource reasons? So are we describing something that is a little bit more lower level that's more practical? Um, and this is always a different discussion and something of a painful discussion for all of the groups. And I'm not sure there's a particular answer for that, um, but that's always something you should consider when reading these recommended practices, is try to understand what are they getting at there. Um, and then um, I think NISA work is a fun job, but there is a lot of slog to it as well. So particularly um, after, the, after the gathering input work is done and the work the group is putting together its draft document, writing that stuff is difficult work. Writing stuff in a, in a way that's meaningful is difficult work. And then uh, responding after the, the public comments have come, have come in, trying to get those addressed is a bit of a slog, but I try to crack the whip and uh, keep people um, motivated as best as I can. Um, I'm going to this, skip this slide, but just it's a, it's a structure for NISO. Uh, we have different working, different working groups that are sorted into different areas that are overseen by leadership groups in um, different areas. And I'm going to skip this slide too for time purposes. But just to talk about our areas of work. So we've got different leadership groups, three leadership groups that are called the Content and Collections Management Topic Committee the Business Information Topic Committee, the Discovery and Delivery Topic Committee, and these are made up of library publishers, vendors, others, who then oversee the individual working groups and standing committees in their areas. So the CCM Topic Committee manages publishing standards like JATS. Um, also, you could say our classic library standards, Z39.19, which is controlled vocabularies, and Z39.29, which is uh, references, bibliographic references, those are two standards that are undergoing review this year. So I, I put them in also to quiz me on my own Z39 knowledge. <laughs> um, and then the Business Information Topic Committee manages things related to licensing. Um, so CIRU or uh, journals moving from one vendor to another, that's transfer, um, altmetrics, business intelligence about citations, that sort of thing, uh, that's in BizInfo. And then the discovery and delivery topic committee is the things that connect people to uh, their topics. So the discovery initiative, KBART, the knowledge base um, and related tools initiative, and then also access and license indicators. So um, putting d metadata at an article level to indicate whether an article is free to read and what its license terms are. That's under that group. So that's just to show you how we sort things out and work through. Um, if you are not already subscribed to our NISO Newsline, um, I think it's a very good publication to, it's a monthly <laughs> newsletter that comes out in the first of the month, so it'll be coming out this afternoon. Um, and it's what's going on at NISO, other things that are going on in the industry. Um, you can, if you go to niso.org slash publication slash newsline, you can sign up for that. Um, and then we also have a quarterly publication, in, Information Standards Quarterly, ISQ, um, which we're transitioning from a print form to an online form. So um, that's changing now, but it's still, uh, I think, worthwhile. It's more uh, big picture, long form articles, um, that sort of thing. So I just want to remind you that standards do the heavy lifting. Once you let them uh, do their work, they, you can um, get running and go very quickly. And if you've got any questions, you can email me or tweet to me or talk to me here. Any questions for now? <clears throat>
Director of Library Systems at Library Technology Services. Um, oh, there we <laughs> and I, I having a hard time recognizing my friend. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Um, it's a very small icon of the front slide. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today to speak to you about the Open Discovery Initiative um, and how this relates to the work that we do here at Harvard. Um, I feel like some of you may have attended presentations that I've done on ODI here before. Can you just give me a show of hands so I'll see how many people may zone out during the <laughs> Not too, too many, okay. Good, so I will start um, and jump right in. Um, so I wanted to set a little bit of context for this discussion today. Um, first is just to note that library um, mission statements um, in our, including our own here at Harvard align with providing broad and comprehensive access to information for our users. And the good news is, is that content providers mission statements align with this as well as discovery provider missions. Um, so it, there's a lot of common understanding around folks um, about what our goals is and what, what we are trying to do to meet researcher needs. So you might wonder, why do we need a recommended practice then to help us out if we're all moving towards the same strategic goal? And what are some of the challenges that we have in providing access to information to our users? Um, so first I wanted to start with a little bit of a review of research history, but I really mean a review of the last 15 years of research history when I think a bulk of change has really happened. Um, so we've come a long way very quickly in the past 15, 20 years or so. Um, so we've moved from the card catalogs into online catalogs. Um, we moved from our beloved indices in print for articles um, into first kind of our standalone databases and then into online interfaces. And we've moved from having separate catalogs of some of our specialty data, our special collections information um, and move from those silos into thinking about more comprehensive lists. Um, so some of the things that we did early to adjust or address some of these concerns were we implemented um, Metalib here, which was our, which is now what you see under the databases tab, although I think the name of that is maybe. The, the names that we call some of these systems have changed over time. And we had our e-journals list. And so users had to go to many front doors in order to get access to a lot of this um, information. Um, and they were fine with this. And in fact, I've lived through many system implementations here at Harvard. So when we implemented Metalib, it was, it was big news. It was a big deal. And it really moved research forward. And when we did the journals A to Z list, um, through SFX and implemented OpenURL. These were great strides forward. Um, but soon after we made those strides, the industry kept changing and information and research kept changing. Um, and so with the rise of effective internet search engines, user expectations changed about what you could really do to access information. Um, and we started having the desire for kind of single search boxes. So initially, Metalib was um, something that's called federated search. So those of you who are here can cast your mind back to, to the Metalib interface. You would go in and you would maybe select either some quick sets, some targets of resources that we as librarians had decided kind of grouped together nicely, or users could pick a set of their favorite backend databases, and they would execute the search. Um, the benefits of this was that they were able to search multiple <coughs> platforms at once, um, and the content lived in, in native systems, so there was no need for duplication um, from our perspectives or duplicate searches. 
But the not so great was that um, these searches were not efficient. Um, those of you who ever used Metalib in that capacity may remember that there was a long delay and you saw kind of things spinning and you waited. Um, when the results came back, they were at best incomplete and confusing. Um, this was because the results came back from each different target database and whatever sort order the target database determined was appropriate. They were somewhat interfiled together and it really they really didn't necessarily meet our users' expectations. Um, and the indexing across all those targets was somewhat inconsistent in how searches were relayed and, and what indices on the back end they might have been applied to. Um, so over time, um, user demand increased to have a better solution for this. Um, so we had some challenges. So first, we're, the first challenge was finding materials. We had that variety of research tools to find the desired content. So we had the library catalogs, databases, and then increasingly external systems like Google, Google Scholar. Um, and then once folks found something, there were challenges potentially in accessing that content and going from a citation into the full text of the article. Um, and so I've just shown a few of the different jumps that and sometimes even now, still, we ask users to jump through some hoops to get to the actual full text. Um, so this started to change in the late 2000s with um, a new concept. And so this was instead of saying, OK, content should live here and here and here and here, and we should move a search out across all of those things and pull results back, it was people were quickly coming to the conclusion that pouring the data into one big aggregated index where things are um, indexed in the same way, displayed in the same way, the same relevancy ranking algorithm would be applied to it because relevancy came up in, as, a, as a desired thing at some point in those um, searching versus just chronological reverse descending, which was a lot of how our older databases work. So there was a, a big change in the industry to think about pouring the content together and really making a massive index that could be used across all of this. Um, that allowed for con consistent indexing across the metadata and um, easier, potentially easier access to the full text once someone had found a record. Um, again, the relevancy ranking. And this is when we really saw the rise of branded discovery services to do this. So I think really the first one of this, which isn't really a commercial product in some ways, was Google Scholar kind of led the road down this. Of They were ingesting a large quantity of data and indexing it and it didn't matter really who owned the data or who created the data um, and then commercial vendors started um, moving in this direction as well so EBSCO came out with um, EBSCO discovery ProQuest was first actually I think with the summon discovery service Ex Libris came out with the Primo Central service or index um, so this allowed folks, these new systems allowed, it, allowed folks to start blending disparate types of data in these bigger systems. So in addition to having these mega indexes of largely article but other types of content, it also allowed um, libraries to pull in their <coughs> library catalogs um, and additional content into a single front end. Um, so the benefits was, was finally providing a kind of single search box, a single place to search across a wide set of the library holdings that you could drill down. So these were the first time that um, facets and other sort of navigation tools to drill down in a um, data set were provided, as well as those relevancy ranking results. Um, but one of the first challenges in these was, and a continued challenge, is that not all the de desired content in library collections are surfaced in some of these tools. Um, so we still have some current discovery challenges. Um, we still currently have a multitude of interfaces. Um, there's variations in the quality of search results across these interfaces. Um, there are variations in metadata standards across both formats and across content sources. Um, we've still got some variations in the quality of metadata that are supplied to any systems. And there are some special concerns um, on occasion related to um, indexing and handling of certain types of language materials, um, both for transliterated and original scripts. Um, so that brings us to the context for ODI. Um, this started way back in 2011 with um, a meeting at the ALA annual conference. And I think um, this was 
soon after you joined, yeah. um, NISO, Ex Libris um, had noted a, a problem kind of in the industry related to these open, or the lack of openness around these indices. Um, so they pulled together a group with NISO to discuss um, that first stage of the process that Nettie described was, is this a work item? Is this something that there is stakeholder interest across all of the stakeholders? So the vendors for the discovery systems, the libraries, and the content providers in working towards evening out the, the playing field. Um, so this was the time in which library discovery services had been on the market from, for about three years. And it was recognized um, that um, although they were beginning to see real big uptake in um, library um, use um, and impact, start beginning to impact lots of users, uh, that agreements between content providers and discovery providers were largely ad hoc. Um, they weren't representative of all content and they were really opaque to customers, meaning to libraries. It was really hard to understand what any of the business relationships between content providers and a specific discovery provider was. Um, and those could vary from a single content provider to any of the discovery providers. So it was really complex in libraries at that time to look at this. Um, so that began a really quick process to get through all the stages that Nettie described. I'm saying that jokingly because <laughs> three years is not necessarily the quickest of There were some years. sloggy times. There were <laughs> definitely sloggy times. Um, but luckily we um, persevered and in June of 2014 um, the recommended practice was released. Um, and this recommended practice includes a vocabulary. So one of the first challenges that we had um, in working on this was that all of the different stakeholder groups had slightly different definitions to terms that we thought were, were common. So we um, kind of came to agreement on what we meant by different, uh, different vocabulary elements. Um, it includes a recommended practice, um, a long, lengthy text. It's a great read, I recommend it. <laughs> um, as well as um, some standards to evaluate conformance. With, with the recommended practice. Um, so what is it? So it's a technical recommendation and it outlines the data elements that should be exchanged between content providers and discovery providers to support um, research. Um, it includes some things about data formats and methods of delivery as well as usage report reporting and um, frequency of updates. So that's another big issue is how often does the content provider's content, how quickly does it get out through the process to be available to end users, and rights of use for that content. Um, there's um, descriptions in there about information that both content providers and discovery providers should give to libraries to help libraries make informed decisions when selecting a discovery system for use or evaluating how their discovery system is working. Um, and it's also a model to allow content providers to work well with discovery providers and ensure that there's no bias um, in either the indexing or the linking of the content. So why does this matter? Um, well, the hope is that it simplifies the process of exchanging data between content <coughs> providers and discovery providers, and that way increases participation so that more and more content is available in the discovery indexes. Um, it ensures that discovery vendors are following um, fair and unbiased indexing and linking. And it hopes to mitigate legal and technical issues that would discourage participation. Um, so soon after the um, recommended practice was published in um, June of 2014, NISO appointed a steering committee, standing, standing committee, to, <laughs> thank you, to, um, continue on with the work of ODI. Um, so as Nettie noted earlier, one of the big things that NISO does is after coming up with a set of guidelines, trying to make sure that people are adopting them, and this actually, as it turns out, I'm learning, um, is one of the more difficult challenges in, in this work. So one of our biggest things is promotion and education about ODI um, to all stakeholders. We also provide support um, to both content providers and discovery providers in adopting the recommended practice. This is again to promote um, conformance. Um, we provide a forum for future discussion. 
Um, we are about to start considering really some next steps related to the recommended practice. I think we've got a few items that have come in and requests from people for expanding or adjusting the recommended practice and it's about two years old now so it seems like it's time to do kind of a soup to nuts review of the entire recommended practice and adjust it. Um, we also work with NISO to identify emerging needs that relate to discovery and determine if they are new work items that may need to be distributed to other um, groups. So we talk to our topic committee, the, dis the discovery to delivery topic committee, um, and we make recommendations um, about those work items. So um, our <laughs> roster, again, echoes what um, Nettie said earlier. It's representative of all of the different stakeholder types um, for this area. Um, so I wanted to dive in a little bit to some of the recommended practices. Um, so they differ depending on what kind of stakeholder group you are. So for content providers, um, there's recommended practices about participation. So every type of content provider, whether it's an A and I or whether it's you know the author or holder of the journal articles themselves or other kinds of content, are encouraged to participate. And this means providing core metadata and the full text um, to discovery providers for indexing. Um, we define core metadata elements that should be provided. So this is your basic citation data, as well as noting that the enriched content should be provided. So this is um, additional subject headings, so the a &I type data. This is um, full text or transcripts, if it's kind of media, um, as well as abstracts and description because the more data you provide into these systems the better richer results people are going to see um, there's also <coughs> disclosure required or recommendations for what information should be provided from content providers to libraries to note how well that content provider is performing in this area and then there's some information on technical formats for exchange <laughs> to ensure that the content that the content provider provides can be consumed by the discovery providers on the discovery provider side, um, again, notes about disclosure. So this is for both libraries um, providing information on um, the content that's indexed and to discovery providers how the content's being used, um, for linking, um, in, ensuring that their linking and indexing doesn't include bias to any particular content, um, and then again, some technical information about data transfer. Um, so one of the big first things the standing committee tackled um, was conformance disclosure, and I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. Um, so this is just ways in which we can provide support to content providers and discovery providers while they were adopting um, the checklist. So the, there's two appendices in the um, recommended practice, one for um, conformance disclosure, for content providers and one for discovery service providers. These are available on our website on the NISO site, so if you're interested in these, you should certainly take a look. Um, what's maybe more of interest is that there is a conformance statement directory available on the website. The URL is here. Um, you'll see that um, most of the people who have completed conformance documents are people who sit on the standing committee. Um, so we are still working on outreach to more vendors. There's not all that more, many more discovery vendors that we could do outreach to, but there are certainly a lot more content providers that we are working on outreach to, to get them to come up with um, their conformance statements. What we've found is that many of the content providers are a little nervous about putting up a conformance statement that may note that they're not 100% confirmed or conformant at this point. So a lot of this is working through that with them and letting them know, no, we know, but it's good to show where you are and there's places for them to put notes on their conformance statement about what work they might be doing to um, move forward on any areas where they're not conformant. So hopefully we'll see a lot of growth in that this next year. Um, so you may have noticed the original ODI recommended practice did not have a section for recommendations to libraries or things that libraries needed to do. There's no conformance checklist for libraries. So that was something that had come up in the initial part of it. And I do feel that libraries have responsibilities as does the rest of the standing committee. So we worked this year to come up with some materials and recommendations <coughs> that would help libraries 
understand more about what ODI is, but also understand what libraries should be doing as good citizens to <clears throat> work through this. Um, so these new guidelines are available on the ODI website. And it's broken down into two areas. Hopefully. There we go. Okay. Um, so um, I won't spend too much time on the first parts of this because hopefully this is stuff that you have learned this morning. Um, so we describe a, you know, a little bit more background about what discovery is and how the kind of ecosystem works, um, as well as why ODI um, was created and what we're working to resolve. But then points four and five on this page are real, the, where the real meat is for libraries. Um, so we've highlighted the things that libraries should be doing related to their discovery service and what libraries should be doing related to their content providers and licenses to promote conformance. So um, we've got the first section that talks about selection of a discovery service provider and what people should be looking for as far as conformance when they're selecting. Um, but the second thing is probably more applicable to Harvard, and this relates to configuring your discovery service provider. Um, I think what we've heard reported from a lot of content providers and seen reported locally, or I've seen aspects of this, is that we sometimes get things started and put it out, and then we walk away and we think we've done it. We've done this project, we're done. Um, it's in fact not that simple with discovery. There's continued maintenance and work. So in initial configuration there, we did a whole bunch of work to get Primo up and running here. But in addition to that, there's work that the discovery to delivery group is doing and that the e-resources team and ITS does to make sure that things continue to work smoothly. Um, so there's just general maintenance that's needed because we're consistently buying new packages, getting new subscriptions, and so forth. So we need to make sure those are optimized inside of our discovery environment. But in addition to that, as you guys know, publisher platforms change all the time. So it's important that we continuously revisit what we've activated, how we have it configured, and so forth, to make sure that it's continuing to work in the way that we expect it to. Um, so we've got more information for folks related to how you should be configuring. Um, but then in addition to that, there's a section about how to advocate that your discovery provider is conformant with the recommended practice. And I think this is an area where we really hope to have more um, work done, both by ourselves and by colleagues in the library department. Because if you look through the conformance checklists that each of the discovery providers published, you'll note that there are some areas where they're conformant, and it's clear that there's conformant. There's some areas where they're partially conformant and still work to be done. There's some areas where folks may have reported that they're entirely conformant, and we as libraries may want to ask them um, if we think that maybe they're not entirely conformant. So there, there's a lot of work to be done here, and just a lot of maintenance work and thinking through um, as discovery services evolve, um, are they continuing to reflect the best needs of our users? Is the, is the checklist highlighting the areas where we may have concerns and may want to advocate for our needs? Um, so I know we're running low on time, so I won't get into this much more, but I do ask that folks read this. And if you have questions, um, please do come back to me and let me know. Um, there's also a statement here for libraries who are in the process of contracting with a discovery service provider that just helps with language about um, noting that the tenants of ODI should be, that it, that's important to your library. So if you know of colleagues who are in the process of selection, um, you may want to point them to this area. Um, so section five of this page talks more about um, an area that I know is of interest to many folks in this room, which is what licensed content is actually available in um, the discovery systems. So um, we, this highlights several places in which um, the ODI committee feels like libraries can have a stronger voice in advocating for user needs. Um, so section A has some sample license language that highlights that when we're signing licenses and selecting content, we, it's really on our shoulders to advocate that it be included in our discovery system. Um, Section B highlights again optimization of content providers. 
And we've actually got a link um, we're starting to amass as part of the ODI's continuing work. Um, guides from content providers that highlight how to best optimize their content in your discovery system. So a lot of the content providers are, are concerned that libraries are merely activating the content potentially in, in the interface for their discovery system. There's additional work related to link resolvers and other things that should be done to really optimize the experience your users have with the content in the discovery system. Um, so that's a little more homework for those of us who maintain um, the um, internal workings of Primo and our link resolver and so forth. Um, and then in addition to that, we have um, sample language for libraries who are looking through their, their collections and noting pockets of co collections that are not available in the discovery tool of choice. Um, so this language can be used in communications that selectors have with any of the vendors to talk about why it's important to have the content in our discovery systems um, and highlight some sections of the recommended practice that we think are applicable to um, provide to content providers because it may be that content providers aren't aware yet of ODI. <laughs> so um, this is supposed to be a toolkit so that librarians who don't have the luxury as I do of living and breathing this, sometimes it feels like daily, um, to have the information at their hands when they're negotiating with vendors. Um, so please do review this, and if you have any questions, let me know. Um, so this slide just takes, to the, takes you to the same, that same talking points um, page where we have outlined some helpful, hopefully helpful hints. And if you read it and you find it's not helpful, let me know that as well, because this is the first draft, first public draft of what we've put together for librarians, and I haven't really gotten all that much feedback on it since it was released in April, so it'd be great to know if there's um, things that we could revise and make clearer. I think sometimes when you work on a recommended practice, it seems so clear to you, but maybe to other audiences, it's not quite as clear. Um, so just to highlight quickly, so why should libraries care about ODI? Well, it relates to having the content your users need inside of your system. Um, and why should content providers and aggregators care? Well, this really does have an impact on use. We know from our statistics that certain populations of our audiences really are starting to go to Primo more and more. They're missing um, very good content if that is their only research tool. Um, and just to note again that our current library front door, although this is also undergoing some change to even more for, for firmly promote just um, Hollis Plush slash Primo, library front doors really now have a single search box and for many of our users that's their first entry into the system. So if the content that you feel is important for them as selectors or licensors isn't there, we risk missing them entirely because they won't know necessarily to go to the databases tab or to go elsewhere to, to find additional content. Um, so the PowerPoint, which will be posted, I'm assuming, on the wiki after this, has links to a lot of the different um, information that's available on the ODI website. Um, we have a Twitter account. We don't have all that many followers. And I, have to, <laughs> I have to note as well, I'm kind of a Twitter idiot, so my co-chair helps largely with the tweeting of things. Um, but we do post stuff occasionally. We also have um, an email list that I recommend that folks um, subscribe to. We send out twice a year kind of a newsletter with updates on our activity. But occasionally, like when we release the library materials, we also um, sent out alerts and that, so that's a great way to stay current with what we're doing. Um, so again, if you have questions, please reach out to me, um, or you can reach out to the steering committee in general. Are there questions? Quiet crowd today. People haven't eaten enough. <laughs> People should get another muffin. Yeah, we please. Thank you. Stick to the script because we're a little bit short on time. So Noel and I are going to 
talk a little bit more about how we negotiate with vendors here at Harvard, and we're going to show you how some of the standards and uh, recommended practices that uh, Nettie talked about uh, become part of our regular work. So to give you some context, we are members of the e-resources unit in ITS. There are eight of us total performing core Harvard-wide services for e-resources, including acquisitions, renewals, licensing, discovery support, and user support. And if you ever want to go to our wiki page, it lists all eight of us with our very complicated titles and uh, <laughs> the things that we like to do. So some of the um, standards and recommended practices that influence our daily work include uh, the standards for usage statistics gathering, which I'll talk about more in a minute. That's counter and sushi. Um, also on our radar are standards for linking, like OpenURL, which are basically the rules for creating dynamic links between citations and an article or other full text resource. And I'll just show you what an open URL looks like. So basically, uh, clicking on a find it link or the view online link in Hollis for an article would create this open URL to the resource and it's invisible to the user, hopefully. It should be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for licensing, there's the um, CRU uh, recommended practice. And I also just wanted to mention DLF's um, ERMI, the Electronic Resource Manage Management Initiative, which many, many years ago helped determine what elements were important to include in e-resource management systems. Um, in 2012, they, a version of the group also published a paper that explains information about all the e-resource standards. Um, so um, there's a link on the slides at the very end to that paper. So we do try to um, include some standards, compliance, and licenses. And for those that are not part of the licensing process, we do communicate with vendors during the negotiation process about what our expectations are. And it's always best to communicate those expectations prior to purchase when you still have some leverage. Um, so here's a partial list of things that we talk to vendors about um, when we're negotiating purchases. Uh, does the vendor provide counter-compliant usage statistics? And normally the standard is um, part of the license. Um, we ask if the vendor supports ODI's recommended practice for discovery, and also is the vendor willing to cooperate with uh, Ex Libris as a vendor. Um, if MARC records are part of our purchase, does the vendor accept Harvard's open metadata policy? Obviously, this is not a national or international standard, um, but we do publish our bibliographic metadata under broad use licenses, and some vendors do need to be convinced that including records in the set is a good idea. Uh, does the resource use an up-to-date version of the open URL standard and if open URL, because if open URL is not supported or out of date, links to our resources might not resolve properly. Uh, we ask if the metadata for the resource is available in SFX and if the vendor has plans to work with Ex Libris to add content to the knowledge base and keep it current. So I wanted to just quickly elaborate on one of the elements, counter statistics, to show the benefit we receive when vendors adhere to the standards and recommended practices. So at Harvard, we collect usage data for as many of our e-resource platforms as possible. So we currently gather over 100 platforms worth of data. We gather statistics in an ex Libris product called USTAT, which you see here. Uh, USTAT uh, automatically pulls in e-journal usage data using Sushi, which I think is a nice protocol. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a standard. That is a standard. That's a standard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we also um, push manually our database usage into USTAT. Uh, we gather additional counter and other uh, locally defined usage reports for journals, databases, platforms, ebooks, and multimedia uh, manually. So this example here shows all e-journal use for a single title, science, um, which is available via multiple platforms. So this is just uh, successful full text article requests from all the platforms, and it gets combined into a single display. Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> uh, so in this example, it shows the top 10 journal platforms used in 2015. This is a report from USTAT that I exported to Excel. The number of titles at each platform varies, so that's a factor to consider when looking at this metric. Um, but it's a pretty neat comprehensive sort of view of, of what, where, where we have a lot of success with some of our platforms. Um, so requiring vendors to adopt a standardized methodology for counting use ensures that we can do like an apples to apples comparison for, for our different products. Um, so it's just really important that they, they adhere to the, to the standards. And as Laura mentioned, robust and well-indexed metadata as well as established identifiers like ISSNs and ISBNs 
um, really help make these services function well. So anything can, the libraries can do to help get all those identifiers established is really time well spent. So, and now Noel's going to talk about licensing. Thanks, Lauren. So I'm, I'm Noelle Ryan. I work in the e-resources unit, and I'm one of four coordinators who um, look after the license negotiation, and generally on behalf of providing Harvard-wide access to, to those uh, electronic resources. Uh, the other coordinators who work with me with the license negotiation are Lorene Esser, who works with the humanities, uh, Nancy Quinn, who works with social sciences, and Kristen Stockloser, who works with the sciences. And um, I uh, have a somewhat different job in, in that I work with uh, all of the libraries, particularly where there are e-resources, where there's more than one faculty library who are paying for those resources. So they're all the cost-sharing resources. And they are uh, typically our larger e-journal packages, such as you know, Wiley, Springer, Elsevier, um, and I also work with um, Neural, the Neural Consortium for those resources where we purchase from, from them. Uh, myself and Kristen are also responsible for signing all the licenses that we do through the e-resources unit. And we also provide consulting and advising to any of the other libraries, any of those faculty libraries who want to do some licensing on their own. Some of the bigger libraries, like uh, the medical library, Countway, uh, here in the law school and also in the business school, they like to do some of their own licensing. And um, with some of the smaller libraries, we will either do the licensing for them or we will consult and advise them uh, if they want to do it themselves. And uh, all of our licenses, we have a physical copy at 625, if anybody is interested, and we also have or, or should have an electronic copy in our ERM system, the Verde system. So people can actually go there, open up the license and see if there's specific terms that they're interested in or have questions about. And of course, uh, anybody can contact us. Uh, we have a lot of contact information on the wiki and uh, they can contact us uh, with any questions they have. Um, so. Uh, so uh, one of the main questions is why does a library uh, need to do licensing at all? And um, before when we were just relying on print content, we didn't have to do any uh, licensing. We just purchased print content and made it available to whoever. Now with the you know, electronic content, we're, we're actually only purchasing access as opposed to ownership. So the, uh, the license, uh, negotiation and the agreement is our way of ensuring that we provide the best access that we can um, and the best uses to our uses of uh, users appropriate to to their uh, research needs and so there, there um, are three steps involved in, in effective negotiation before I go into the, the issues involved in that I will say that we have those, those issues are the basis of uh, the Harvard Standard License. We do have a Harvard Standard License for the libraries. And this is what all of our coordinators use when we are negotiating with uh, publishers and vendors. And this is a, actually a great tool to use because it is our preferred language for different clauses and for different things that we want. And for example, um, for example, if we talk, when we talk about authorized users, we have a very simple uh, statement of what our authorized users are, that, that they're users in a Harvard library or Harvard campus facility, or they're users with a Harvard ID or a Harvard library ID. And this is often opposed to what publishers or vendors want to say what, a, what an authorized user is for a library. They can be very specific, and in some cases, you know, overly too specific for, for, for our needs. Um, so, our, and the other good thing about our, our standard agreement is that it has been vetted by the OGC, 
Um, so it, it has our programmatic language, language, it's more sort of language that we can understand um, uh, rather than taking what, what uh, publishers uh, will want to give us. So we will either use our uh, license to give to some of the smaller publishers who may not have license agreements themselves or don't have the, the resources to work on licensing. And if, in other cases, if we get an agreement from a publisher, we will use our template language uh, where we think it's appropriate to, to, to um, install uh, the, the, our preferred language. So what went into getting that, uh, that standard license together is what we call the licensing need assessment. And it's looking at different, different several different issues to come up with a, 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 a good license agreement. And when you're going through those, looking at different issues, we always want to keep in mind what, what is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement because there can be, there, sometimes you just, you can't, you can't negotiate an agreement and you'd have to walk away from a negotiation. But you should always have something in mind. What, what are you going to do for your users in that case? And going through this needs assessments can help you get, get to that place where you know what your best alternative is going, is going to be. And so when, when you're looking at the, the needs assessment, you're looking at the um, product related issues. So what is it we're licensing? What is the actual content? Do, do we already have it in print? Are there comparable uh, resources out there um, that we could use instead if, if we have to? Then we look at the user-related issues. Who are our users? Where are our users? You know, what do, what do they want to do with it, with, with the with the content? And as I said before, are you well? What our definition of an authorized user is usually different from what a publisher's or a vendor's definition of a, of an authorized user is. And uh, the the other thing um, in the user-related issues is the extent to what users want to do with the content. Do they want to print it? Do they want to download it? Do they want to share it with other people in or outside of the university? And um, where we uh, have in our standard license, which would differ from a vendor's license, is in the, the extent of use. Most of uh, the license you see from publishers they want to be very specific in how much content we can use or download or print. And we're constantly changing it to a reasonable portion, um, a reasonable amount. So there's does be some to and fro in trying to get that uh, nailed down. Uh, there are also sort of library related issues. Uh, libraries want to do ILL. Libraries want to provide uh, course packs. Libraries want to provide course reserves. And often there are, um, they are things that publishers don't necessarily want to give us the rights to do. So we have to really make sure that they are in, in, in a license that uh, we, we would be happy to sign. And as um, Lauren mentioned as well, usage statistics are important to libraries, especially you know, for collection development. And uh, the more standardized they are across the different e-resources, the, the easier it is for, for collection development uh, to determine what and what they may or may not want to pur purchase. Um, <clears throat> and one of the other issues with the library related issue is the area of liability. Um, publishers and vendors you know, constantly want the libraries to be responsible for the actions of their users and that is something that we definitely you know, cannot do our FTE just for our students is, is 20, 20, 000, 20 plus thousand, and there is no way that you know, we can control what they're going to do with the, with the content and how, how they're going to use it. Um, uh, other, there's license related issues such as you know, what's the duration of the, the license, uh, how is it going to be renewed, and, what are termination or, or enforcement issues, which I'll talk about later. Usually, you know, uh, publishers want you to have a longer license, the three or a five year license, and sometimes they may offer better terms uh, for that. 
In, in 2009, when the economy was going down, we switched from having sort of multiple year licenses for some of our bigger providers to having single year uh, licenses just to, to cope with that because once the license is signed, uh, that is the agreement that is in place. And unless you have clauses in that to get out of it for specific reasons, you're, you're bound by that, that contract. And um, <clears throat> other uh, license related issues specifically for Harvard and that we have in our standard agreement is to do with the use of the Harvard name. Again, many publishers will want to say, yes, Harvard has purchased this, that, and the other, and they, they think it's great. And um, <laughs> that is something that we, we absolutely cannot agree to either. So we do actually have a use of uh, Harvard name clause in our license, and that has to be in, in all of our licenses. And uh, any, we do get requests uh, from publishers to use the Harvard name in various contexts. And for those requests, we work with the trademark program to see if it's appropriate. But if it's anything to do with promoting their product, uh, the trademark program will say no. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, once we have the, uh, the, the, the license needs assessment, uh, we know what we want out of the license and what we need out of the license, then we start the negotiation process. And that can be over the phone, it can be in person, it can be by email. And typically it can be a variation of all those, all three of those. But we would either have an agreement from a publisher that we would edit and track changes and we would send it back and forth. So some licenses can take a while to, to negotiate depending on you know how difficult we think they're going to be. Um, uh, we'll go back and forth till we get we get uh, an agreement. But the, the final license, ideally, it's going to be signed by both parties. So ideally, it really should you know have mutually agreed upon terms that we both think we can live with, and that it will be for access for a specific content, uh, for a specific time, and for a specific fee. Um, so. Uh, once we've signed the license and uh, the, the resource is up and running, what may come into its force then are enforcement issues. And um, usually th these are penalties in the license and they're for either party and they relate to the failure to conform to some of the license clauses. So typically the obligations on the license behalf are to do with the quality of service or the withdrawal of the license contents. So again, in our Harvard standard license, we have a quality service of the, the content should be available 98% of the time. And then that other 2% of the time is for scheduled downtime, and uh, any publishers or vendors are supposed to let us know in, in advance when that's going to happen. So if, if that could be a, you know, a, a a, a, a place where they may not be able to conform, conform to the license. The other one that we, we see a bit is the withdrawal of license contents. So sometimes they may have to take content out of a, a resource um, because it's defamatory or it may be, there may be copyright issues, uh, uh, copyright infringement issues. And um, we have a thing in our license to say, you know, depending on how much content is taken out, if it makes the, the use, if it makes the whole resource less useful, then that may be, you know, a failure to conform to the contract and we, there may be remedies, you know, for that. For that. Um, the other thing with the withdrawal of licensed content is, you know, the difference between aggregated content and just one publisher content. We have no control over um, aggregated content yeah, for like for example the EBSCO, some of the EBSCO data databases are aggregated databases. So whoever the third party publishers that EBSCO may work with, they're perfectly entitled to remove that content and we actually have no control uh, over that. So some of the, one of the performance obligations that falls on us is uh, to do with breaches and cure activities. And breaches is actually the most common one we experience is to do with uh, excessive downloading. 
And that usually, it happens throughout the year, but it really happens towards the end of the year, or the end, uh, in December and again around this time of the year, and it, it can start to happen again. And it's excessive downloading either intentionally or not intentionally. So a lot of users may not know, you know, they will not know every clause of a license and what they can do with content and what they can't. So they may engage in downloading full issues of journals or full chat, full books, entire books and loads of entire books. And um, <clears throat> We have, a, we have a clause in our license agreement, again, which is different from what publishers want. They usually want us to, to notify them when it happens. For us, it's the other way around. We only know that something is going on typically when a publisher gets in touch with us and tells us, you know, that uh, we, we, we notice some automated activity where, you know, there's somebody maybe or may not be using a robot to download content. Now, the, the unintentional use is where actually some of these credentials have been taken by a third party and they've gone in and started down downloading uh, as much content as they can. So the, the cure activities is we have it in our, our standard agreements that we will work with publishers when they notice that and they tell us that something is going on. And we typically work with uh, Lawrence, Laura's group and Hewitt, Hewitt technology in general, especially if there's any IDs that have been compromised, to try and find out uh, what's going on and uh, stop it as soon as uh, stop it as soon as possible. And there's also an onus on us to you know get back to the publisher and reassure them what's going on, and in some cases ask them to turn access back on if if they if they turn it off. Um, so if we can't cure uh, those breaches, that could also be, you know, if it's a material breach of the contract, that could certainly lead to early termination. And early termination is a clause that, again, it can relate to either party, depending on who thinks who has, you know, breached, breached the, the license. Um, so uh, there are also some alternatives um, available, and both uh, Laura and I think Nelly have uh, referred to some of them, one, or to one of them at least. Uh, one of them is uh, consortial licenses. As I said earlier, I coordinate uh, the, the neural licenses we have, and uh, neural is one of our bigger consortiums that we're involved with. Uh, the good thing about that is that they do the license negotiation for us, and sometimes they do the pricing negotiation as well. And if you're working on behalf of 30 or 40 members, that sometimes you know can be better than working just as from Harvard, Harvard's viewpoint. And um, we can get better deals. Uh, both in pricing and license negotiation. Um, we, do, we do work with Neural for uh, quite a few resources, even some of our bigger ones. And I know uh, the Law Library work with NELCO, the New England Law Library Consortia, and the Divinity Library also work with the Boston Theological Institute. So uh, we're, we're, we're working with, with different con consortia. The other alternative is, as uh, CIRU, which is the NISO Recommended Practices. And that came about in uh, 2006. And there are more than 40 publishers now, I think. Oh, yes. more I'm adding publishers. more almost every week, so I'd say it's a lot more than that. I would say 80 to 100. So and, and more, more than, than those that. afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and more than 100 libraries. Yeah, there's yeah, there's yeah, load yeah. loads. So what it is, it's sort of a set of you know shared understandings of the publisher and the library's expectations around the sale and the use of electronic content. But it's all done without a formal license agreement. It, it does cover uh, similar things that are in a license agreement, uh, re respective to you know users' rights, what they can do, what they can't do, um, users' permissions, archival rights, uh, perpetual access, confidentiality, um, and right now we do have several journal subscriptions that we subscribe to through through zero, to zero. Um, 
Yeah, it's meant for small things where it's not, it's, it takes too much time for you, the company or the library, or this, this quite extensive negotiation which you've just described. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, the, the ones that we have, they're, yeah, they're very, they're smaller publishers who maybe have one or two or, you know, three journal journals in, in total and that, we, that, that, that they would use. Obviously, it's not uh, appropriate to perhaps, you know, dealing with Elsevier, especially if you're, you know, you're dealing with a whole package. It wouldn't be appropriate to Elsevier anyway. <laughs> they wouldn't let you uh, get away with that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so uh, this is just the eResources Unit Wiki page, specifically on license, licensing, and there are loads of resources uh, up there, as well as all of our contact information. So uh, certainly do uh, I recommend that you have a look at that, and we are constantly we're we're adding <coughs> information or updating information um, there as, as as we come across it. So. Any questions? Okay. I have a question. Can you generalize uh, for any one of your negotiation projects? Is it possible to state an average time for when something comes across your desk to please, can you get this done for us to how long? I'm sure every project is different. <laughs> um, with, with the bigger publishers, obviously it's going to take more and more time. How much is that? Well, it can take uh, a couple of months. It can take a couple of months. If you take the big packages, like Elsevier, for yeah. example, uh, depending on the type of agreement we have, sure. we have an agreement where we can add and cancel yep. what we want. Yeah, no, I can imagine so that's, that's a that's huge take, thing. Especially across you know, however many libraries, even just within yeah. Harvard, who are subscribing to Elsevier titles. Yeah. If they want to cancel, or you know, maybe it's then like just an e, an e product, not necessarily journals, but maybe some database on X or Y. It, yeah, I mean, it, it it can be fast, especially coming up to to the to the end of the fiscal year yeah, as yeah. well, where we're dealing yeah, with true. people who want to buy yeah. you know, some one time money that they need, yeah. that they need to spend. Yeah. Um, so yes, we certainly have to take And the vendor's ha also happy to take your money, so they want yes. to do so yeah. But that can often be used as a bit of leverage yeah. in, in some cases to try and get. But in general, we can look at a license and if we think that it has the Harvard specific, if they're going to agree to the Harvard specific yeah. uh, terms that we have, we certainly can be a bit more forgiving maybe yeah. in terms of other clauses yeah. and accepting their clauses if they're more or less. Yeah. You know what we think is appropriate to them. So yeah. it really can depend on the on the resource. It's an art, not a science. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if any of the other coordinators want to chime in. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone has any questions for any of the other speakers today? Now's your time. Kind of have a catch-all question. Um, it, it sounds like for these different standards, we have some windows during license negotiation and renewal where we can kind of push our agenda a little bit. Um, what do we do in the three to five years in between when some, you know, a new standard comes out? It sounds really compelling. Do we have to wait? How do, how do we get a, a, a vendor to agree to something, or how do we start working on ourselves? In my view, I think for a lot of the bigger packages that maybe haven't come up for renewal, but that I know are missing from Primo Central Index and therefore discovery for many of our users, I don't think we should wait. I think the honest truth, though, is um, when we're about to pay them money or renew a contract is when we have the most, the biggest, um, ear. The biggest ear. But I think getting the information in front of them as soon as possible even if it's not going to result in an immediate change, it is a better methodology just because then when you do get to that five year mark or whatever the terms are, it's not something that they're seeing for the first time. Um, but I also do wonder if Nero needs to be playing a bigger role in some of um, promoting some of these standards because it is actually a place where we combine our voices with others. And that's been one of, I think, that is a, a really difficult thing for libraries to do, especially when it comes to money and deals and, you know, the vendors really have the upper hands and 
it's not like you're buying soap. <laughs> you're negotiating and bartering and all of these things. And so libraries typically, aside from these consortia, do it separately. And that puts us at the disadvantage sometimes in trying to talk and trying to advocate. Um, because I think a lot of times what changes things is things are hearing from multiple users. And I think that was something that happened with the success of Orpheus when you were around. Yeah. Um, was that there, it was easier to see the magic of open URL when it was first being implemented and for libraries to get behind it as groups and for it was clearer to content providers and system providers why this was a benefit for them. Open discovery is a little bit more opaque, um, so it's harder to get that collective voice and to really um, sell the message. So one of the things we're working on with one of our newer and maybe perhaps very enthusiastic members of the um, standing committee is to kind of work on pitches for the different audiences to try to help us in getting the messaging out about why it's important and to maybe reduce some of the opacity or the level of detail that comes in reading the recommended practice itself so that people can really um, Although I will see say with, the, with open URL, things really started to happen when CDL's contracts were all yeah. for renewal and CDL put it as a requirement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you saw vendors yeah. respond. So at Harvard also we have the sort of the added complication that like the e-resources unit does the negotiation on behalf of the libraries, the people controlling the money are the libraries. Mm -hmm. So if they really need the content, we buy it. Right. Even yeah. though the vendors may not um, comply with some of our requests. You don't so, always have a number of sources to get the stuff you need. Yeah. So coming up this summer, we're going to be developing some new e-resources working groups where I think these topics will be better collaborated on and we can probably have a more strong voice with, with mm -hmm. the vendors. Any other questions for the our panelists? Just okay. one more on that. Comments you just made those those e resources working groups that yeah. you develop are those all going to be people from ITS or are you going to have larger you're going to involve uh, people from uh, other parts of the community? So right now there are there's uh, a few active ones and one that's been charged and generally there's an e resources unit member on each working group and then everyone else is from the libraries. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our speakers, Nettie and Laura and Lauren and Noel. And please keep your eye open for HL Comms for our next event in two weeks, like June 23rd, I believe it is. Um, and eat some more food. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.